I want to welcome you all to the Future of News on behalf of the President's College, the Lifelong Learning Program at the University of Hartford, and also the Connecticut Mirror. I'm John Dankowski. I host events here for the Connecticut Mirror, and I work on podcast projects. For a long time, I was in public radio, and I host an awful lot of events like this in person, but I also still do them on Zoom, especially in the, in the course of the last couple of years. So I'm really glad that you were able to join us this evening for this really interesting conversation. Before we get started, I want to say that we will give you a chance to ask some questions of our panelists, and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. You've probably been in these Zoom meetings before, I'm sure. So you can uh, find that Q&A button, and that's the best way to put some questions to our panelists. I will try to get to as many of them as I can throughout the course of the program, and we'll really focus in on a few of those closer to the end. Our panelists include Elizabeth Hamilton, who's executive editor of the Connecticut Mirror. She's been with the Mirror since 2018. She was a longtime journalist with the Hartford Current, and she helps to lead this organization that I'm a part of into the future. Beth, it's good to see you here, and thanks so much for joining us for this. Glad to be here. Thanks for doing it. Daniela Altamari is a longtime colleague of mine. She's worked at the Hartford Current on the politics desk for many, many years, and she recently left to start a new venture. She's joined Route 50. Her focus is on the political fallout of the coronavirus crisis. We're going to be hearing more about her new venture. I've been talking to her on the radio and on programs like this for a very long time. And Daniela, congratulations on the new job. I can't wait to hear about it. And it's really good to see you. Thank you very much. And Amanda Crawford is an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut. She teaches media law, press history, and other journalism classes. She's a national board member of the Journalism and Women's Symposium and a former political reporter for Bloomberg News, the Arizona Republic, and a newspaper that is a, is a sister publication to the Hartford Current, the Baltimore Sun, a sister publication in a lot of ways, both, both good and sort of unfortunate over the course of the last several years. Amanda, it's really good to have you here. Thank you so much for lending your expertise to our conversation. Thank you for including me. And Amanda, I, I'll start with you. Can you think about the, the future of news and the pre pre present of news, I'll say, in order to converse with young journalism students, with people uh, in academia, and also people who still work in the journalism world right now. When you think about the future of the business that, that you've been a part of for such a long time, what do you think? Are you hopeful about the future of news? There's no doubt that we are in hard times and maybe we have to go through, you know, to get past. Um, but I am hopeful because I think that what journalism is about and what I try to share with my students, the spirit of journalism in the United States is and something we really need right now. The, you know, speaking truth to power, um, standing up for what's right, um, helping to ensure democracy. These are really important callings. And those are the callings of the press in the United States. So I think that, you know, it's important in these troubling times where we're not always trusted and where the country's divided, um, that we kind of go back to that calling and make sure we're doing the best that we can to tell that story. I often say that journalists have not done a really good job of telling our story. And we need to talk about the good we do and what our role is in democracy, because it's important. I, I'm really glad you, you said that. I think we'll be talking a lot about the uh, ensuring democracy part of this job. <laughs> I'm wondering what the conversations are like between you and your students right now and what the young people who you're teaching who want to go into journalism think about the industry and may maybe how they talk about it differently than, than you did when you started or that I did when I started. Well, I think they're really attuned to some of the failings of journalism. Um, and I think we all, you know, are, are, are reconciling ourselves with in moments where we didn't do a good job of um, telling the full story or lifting up all voices, um, they see that. And I think they want to do better. Um, and I think that journalism as a whole, we need to do better. And that doesn't mean doing weak stories that um, you know cowtail to those in power. It means standing up um, for what's right, no matter what. Um, and you know, I think there's a big push of, you know, interest in social justice and um, human rights among young people. And they, you know, when you talk to them about it, they see the power of journalism to, you know, have a real impact. Do, do they see it as a career path, though? Because that's the other piece of this. If you're, if you're getting into journalism as a career path and you see some of the challenges placed in front of you, 
it's wonderful to think that you're going to change the world and to do some of the important work that we need to get done. But on the other hand, there's also the need to, to have a living. And there's a lot fewer jobs of the type that we had, certainly, in traditional journalism than there used to be. Well, that, that's for sure. They're not following the same path as probably all of us did. Um, you know, I graduated from a college, you know, and went to a major Metro Daily, um, you know, and those jobs were really secured and they were unionized at the time, you know, and certainly that's not the world we're in. But um, they're more entrepreneurial. They, they see the, um, the fact that, you know, there's all these different ways to tell stories and all these different ways to be part of the conversation and to communicate information. And I think they're more open to those possibilities. Um, let's be clear, we're, the work world in gen well, journalism has been changing for a while. The work world is changing. In the great resignation, we are seeing the younger generation demanding for things to be different. Um, and so I think we're gonna see work life changing in lots of ways. Um, and certainly in journalism, they recognize it's not gonna look the same. Um, but I, I am hopeful that many of them have that fire to carve their own path. I, I will say that in the last uh, several months or so, I've had the opportunity to hire a few young journalists at my other job at, at Science Friday, the national radio program that I work for. And they're relatively fresh out of school. They maybe did an internship and they've never once really covered anything where they got to talk to people in person. They've been sitting at home like we are right now, talking to people on Zoom and talking people on the phone. And that's been their entire career of journalism. So that, that's something we can maybe get into a little bit uh, in a bit. Uh, Daniela, how about you? I, I would love to hear more about what you're doing right now in the new job that you have. But in part, I want to ask you about how you're thinking about the present and future of journalism after leaving uh, an organization, the Hartford Current, that you've been with for such a long time, that clearly has fallen on the hardest possible times. And I know it pains you as someone who loves the Hartford Current w where it's kind of headed. But what are you thinking about journalism right at this moment? Uh, really interesting question and so many answers. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, what I'm, what I'm thinking of, um, you know, really yesterday and today, I've kind of been consumed by this story that the Washington Post had on the libs of TikTok. And I don't know if anybody has followed this whole saga, um, but uh, the short version, everyone should read the story because it's fantastic. But there's a woman on TikTok who has many, many, you know, tens of thousands of followers and a bit, very big platform. She's been, you know, on Tucker Carlson. She's been all over the place. And um, the Washington Post, you know, she's anonymous and the Washington Post found out who she was and they went to her doorstep and they interviewed her. And there's been this huge backlash, everyone from Glenn, Glenn Greenwald to, you know, every right wing, you know, person has been attacking the reporter who wrote the story and attacking the Post. And you know, I, I've been thinking about this because, first of all, what the reporter did, Taylor Lawrence is the reporter who wrote the story for the Post. What she did was she went to this, she found out who this person was through, you know, investigative reporting. She went to their house, knocked on their door. We all have done that probably dozens or hundreds of times in our careers if we've been at this long enough. And it's a very basic staple of journalism. But all of a sudden, that's been called doxing, that's been called, you know, harassment. Never mind, this person is a public figure who's whole, you know, stock and trade on TikTok has been to attack, you know, LGBTQ people and teachers who are teaching, you know, critical race theory and, and about, you know, um, uh, supporting, you know, gay and trans kids. So, you know, it, it, her whole thing, the, the, the whole TikTok account is dedicated to taking down people, everyday people. But when the reporter showed at this up at this person's doorstep, there's just been this huge outcry. And I've been thinking a lot about it. And really what it tells me, first I was thinking, well, of course, reporters go and knock on people's doors. That's what they do. Well, why is that so bad? But really what it's telling me now, I'm thinking about it more, is that people... Uh, who have an agenda, who have a political agenda, just want to sow distrust and chaos. And they'll start saying things like, you know, this isn't journalism, this is doxing and all this stuff. No, it's journalism. We all know that. But they just want to create this chaotic situation where false information can kind of rise to the surface. And it's just been really interesting in light of the title of this discussion. You know, it started thinking, of, it started me thinking about the future of journalism and what that will mean. Yeah, and and there's so many there's so many parts to that. I mean, one 
part of the future of journalism that's a very scary part of the future of journalism that I know Amanda will talk a little bit more about in the future of this conversation is, uh, Daniela, that, that people put their trust in a whole lot of sources and the traditional news sources that we trust, that we're a part of, that's not really where the trust lies. The people out in America trust sources that they curate themselves. And if that is, in the case of this um, account on Twitter, someone who has very strong political beliefs, then they're only going to get that information. But I think the more interesting and also insidious part of that is that I think that that account has about 600,000 followers, which is not nothing, but it's not the hugest platform in the world. It's the very influential people, including podcast hosts, Fox News hosts, actually take an awful lot of information from that account and spread it much more widely and turn it into news that's not really news. And to me, Danielle, that's one of the most fascinating things about that entire story and that we have to grapple with in the future of news. It really is how people are distributing information, even false information. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Trump, of course, was the master of that, right? You know, even after his Twitter account was taken away, you know, he can still get, get his message out there that's filled with, you know, all kinds of false information. And it's just, just showing an, is sowing enough chaos and discord uh, to get people to wonder, people who, you know, as you said, are consuming a certain news diet. So I think that's really one of the biggest threats facing our industry and democracy in general. I, but before I get to Beth, though, I, I, I want to loop back to, to something that you've recently done. You, you have taken on a, a new job here, and it's an entirely different organization than, than the Hartford Current. Could you maybe explain what Route 50 is and what you're doing with this new journalism venture? Sure. Um, so this is a, um, a website that covers state and local governments nationally. And uh, it's read primarily by state legislators and staff, state legislative staffers and municipal leaders and local leaders and county officials and uh, folks at all levels of government. So it's kind of a, a niche publication that is focused uh, for a very specific audience. Uh, very different than what's been, what I did at The Current, which was for a broad audience. But I think as you kind of alluded to, you know, the media landscape is just so, uh, you know, divided and, and so, um, you know, newspapers, we all know are losing circulation. Who watches the evening news anymore? I mean, my mom in the other room, she's 86. 889, sorry. Um, you know, the, those are the folks who are watching the things that, you know, probably 30 years ago, everybody got a daily paper, everybody watched, you know, uh, Cronkite or whoever, um, Dan Rather, whoever uh, the, the evening anchor was. So I think it goes to your point that, you know, those mass publications are struggling in a lot of ways. So, Beth, you are also a, a refugee from the Hartford Current. Um, you've, you've worked outside of journalism and you've worked inside of journalism for a very long time. And now with you, you're with the Connecticut mirror, how has your view of journalism changed throughout your career? Wow. Couldn't have hit me with an easy question, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I started right out of college at a weekly newspaper. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had worked at the college newspaper and I started doing what a lot of journalists in my generation did, which was, you know, do the police blotter and cover graduations. Daniela, this probably sounds familiar to you. Um, all of that. And then, and then Daniela and I actually worked together on two other occasions. Um, we worked at the News Times in Danbury and at the Hartford Current. Um, and I just kind of worked my way up a ladder that was fairly obvious and clearly established during that period of time. You know, you would start at a, at a small paper, you would start in the smallest beat, you would then progress up into more significant beats of, you know, you'd go from covering features and high school graduations to covering the mayor's office, say. Um, and then you would go to a bigger newspaper and you would repeat the same process all over again. That has kind of been blown out of the water um, in the last however many years. Um, 
you know, I left the Hartford Current in 2009 during a round of layoffs, and I did not think I would re-enter journalism at that point. I was pregnant with my my son um, when I was laid off, and I just assumed that that was it. I was not going to return. Um, it was really um, the election um, of Donald Trump that prompted me to reconsider getting back into the profession um, because I was so kind of outraged by this idea that there was no such thing as fact anymore that we could actually rely on. Um, and I felt very strongly, and I still do, that there is, and that journalists of, of this generation are very, very committed to that. I mean, but the short answer is, you know, I see my role as a journalist both in exactly the same way I saw it when I was 21 and wholly different in some respects, um, because I do believe that our fundamental purpose is to inform people so that they can participate in their democracy, so that they understand the world around them. Um, but now we have this additional burden of kind of trying to fight this uphill battle of convincing people that we are, we have the facts right, that we're not uh, you know, the enemy of the people, that we're, that we, um, that we're not doxing you because we show up at your door and to ask you a simple question. Um, so I also think that the advent of digital journalism has changed the way we, we tell stories. Um, it's opened up new possibilities for us as writers and photographers and data professionals um, and given us much more freedom in terms of how we reach people and the types of audiences that we reach. So um, I guess that's a short answer. I don't know if I answered your question. I <laughs> no, so. Well, I, 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 think, I think you did answer the question. I think that it's, it's that it gets back to something that we're already getting questions about you know, how can legit journalism combat the indoctrinated mistrust of how real news is gathered? And, uh, you know, Beth, you say one of the things that drew you back to the profession was a, a sense that you had that uh, American society was saying, you know, facts don't really matter. And you're like, hell yeah, they do matter. I think, you know, we, <laughs> we've got to get facts out to people. But how exactly do we combat the fact that so many people don't believe that an actual fact is a fact or that facts actually matter if they come from certain sources. I mean, you can continue to do your job, but how do we actually get people to believe the truth? Well, I mean, I think that's done on both very micro level and macro level, right? So we're all engaged in that process every day as human beings. I know I am, I'm sure Daniela is, um, and that, we educate uh, individually and we, through our news organizations, seek to build trust with communities through the legitimacy of the work that we do. The hope is that, you know, the more that we write stories that are meaningful to people's lives and they can see are true when the truth bears itself out eventually, because it usually does, that they will then start to re-engage with fact or they will continue to engage with fact. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's on us. It's a huge burden. I mean, I used to have a pin that I had in my cubicle when I was, I don't know, 25. And it said, um, you know, uh, blame me, I'm from the media. I'm all, I'm to, I'm all, I'm to blame. I'm from the media because even back then, you know, we were the we were the conveyors of bad news, right? So you would you would you would see this kind of reaction even then. You would I was a cop reporter for a while in a city, and you know you'd have to knock on some mother's door, uh, you know, at some ungodly hour because her kid had just been killed. You know, nobody wants to talk to you when you're doing that, you know? So there, there has always been a level of 
resistance and animosity to journalists um, for lots of reasons. And I think Donald Trump just capitalized on that during his presidency. Well, and, and look, Amanda, you've written about this, the, the, the level of trust in the, in the press by the American people has fallen to really historic lows. I know that uh, Gallup and Pew, many organizations try to track this sort of thing. Uh, maybe you can give us a sense of just how little the media is distrusted, even compared to the American public uh, that the 25-year-old Beth Hamilton encountered as, as, a, as a young reporter. Well, first, I just want to respond to something that Beth said that I thought was yeah. interesting. Certainly, for all times, there has been distrust in the media, but we cannot ignore the fact that the right wing in this country has been oh, aggressively challenging the truth of the mainstream media through their own partisan press since the start of talk radio in the 80s. So this is, a, and you know, certainly before that in politics and political messaging, but we've seen a long attack on the media that has resulted in the levels of trust that we see now, which certainly were exploded <laughs> you know, by Donald Trump. Um, and so as far as numbers go, Pew's numbers in August, um, their study that came out, the good news is for um, you know, Beth and Daniela, um, especially I think for the Mirror and you know, our, our local NPR channels and stuff is that local news is still where the trust does live. Um, local news coverage has not had as significant of a hit, especially in a partisan lens, as the national news media has. And so we look at trust of the local of local media. Um, it's stayed pretty constant from 2016 to 2021 among Democrats. It fell from about 82% to about 75% among all voters. Um, and then the big hit for local news was with Republicans, as it was in the national news. Um, local trust from Republicans slipped from 79 to 66% in that study. Um, if you look at the national news media, um, you know, the trust was always lower. Among all, among all voters, it fell from 76 to 58 percent, the level of trust from 2016 to 2021. But among Republicans, it fell from 70 percent to 35 percent. And that's the huge drop off. I mean, I think there's, you know, as Beth said, so many reasons that we can, you know, put together that this has happened, um, you know, but part of it has been a, a campaign to discredit mainstream news and discredit the truth. Um, I don't, you know, we, we can't um, account for that with many of the measures we can take, um, but we can start to rebuild trust. And I think part of that, something else that Beth said that I, that I latched onto is she said that they need to see that what we write is true, right? We have not been transparent as journalists, not near as transparent as we could be or should be about how we do our work, the practices that are involved in a story, why it's important, telling people what we don't know. Um, and, I, and I think we're seeing a move towards more transparency, but if there's a place where all media outlets probably need to work better to win trust, it's being more transparent about exactly what we do, how we do it, how we got the facts for the story, why we wrote it this way, why we think it's important. But what, do, what do you think that looks like, Amanda? I mean, give us an example of what that would look like that's different than what a lot of the media does right now. A few extra paragraphs that are, yeah. we went out and we tried to interview all these people. These were the ones who were talked to us. We looked for scientists that picked up, you know, who supported the senator's ideas and there were none. You know, whatever this is, I think there's just more that we know that we just kind of tuck into the story. We just say that there's no comments or we just leave a side out or we don't explain everything. Um, you know, maybe we need to say we walked and knocked at their door and that is a standard practice. <laughs> you know, but we did not put their address on social media or something. You know, I think there's just more explaining and especially when we don't know, um, you know, we're always a little quick to run with things we think we know. Daniela, I'm wondering how that, that strikes you, that, that, that idea that, that transparency amongst journalists is one of the things that would help to build a trust in journalists. Absolutely, I, I think that's uh, I think that's needed. In fact, I think you know it, it perhaps even goes further than that. I mean, I think we need to turn the lens on our industry that we have turned on on other industries. I mean, the journalism industry uh, is a mess, and local news is in crisis, as we all know. And when I look at what 
um, a certain hedge fund is doing to the Hartford Current and other Tribune newspapers. Um, you know, uh, that's not something we're comfortable reporting on ourselves. Um, but I think it would perhaps go a long way towards uh, building uh, that kind of trust uh, that, that Amanda was discussing. I know that it's a difficult subject, but I guess I'm just wondering if you could briefly, Daniela, talk our listeners who don't exactly understand the scope of what's happened at the Hartford Current, explain exactly the difference between the Hartford Current you worked at 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and the Hartford Current of today. Yeah, so the Hartford Current that I worked at and that Beth worked at uh, was you know, a, an incredible institution, had a very large staff. Uh, at one point, I think the numbers approached 400. Uh, that was, I think, before our time, Beth. But it was, you know, we had a, a, a huge number of photographers and photo folks, like something like, you know, 40 people working in the photography department, graphics editors, you know, all kinds of people. Um, obviously, given what we know about the newspaper industry in terms of reader habits and everything, when you look back, you know, I'm a bit of a hoarder. So in my house, I have a lot of old newspapers and every once in a while I'll come across one from like 1999 and it's this thick with ads from, you know, G Fox, ads from car dealers, page upon page upon page of classified ads. All those are gone, right? The, the, those don't exist anymore. Some cases, literally businesses are gone. Uh, car ads and classifieds have moved elsewhere. Um, so we know that the industry, the newspaper industry isn't what it was in the 90s. And I don't think anyone expects that. The, the, the problem is, and helping, uh, again, you know, going to that transparency and making people understand what's going on, isn't that the business model kind of crashed for newspapers, because it did. But a lot of newspapers have been able, or some newspapers have been able to make smart decisions and reinvest and, and survive and thrive. Um, the problem is, is that certain hedge funds have bought in uh, to, you know, both uh, Tribune, uh, McClatchy, Gannett, you know, Gatehouse, uh, these big chains, um, and they don't care about the product. They don't seem to care about the product. They don't seem to care about the communities that the newspapers serve. They seem to care about short-term profit and sort of enriching themselves. And so, you know, all these trends in the news industry are a fact and you have to learn to, to live without department store ads and classifieds, right? You have to learn to live with the fact that people are getting their news online, but you can do that if you make smart decisions. What you can't do is have, you know, wealthy people bleeding things dry and just getting back to close the circle on our, you know, photo staff, which numbered around 40 uh, back in the nineties, we had one photographer at the Hartford Current who left two weeks ago. So now there are zero staff photographers. I hear they're hiring somebody, I hope they are. That would be fantastic. But to go from a staff that big, you know, to, to one guy, to nobody is, is pretty jarring. And the same has happened in the news side. You know, there's no editorial page editor. There's no, I mean, you can just go down the list and, you know, it's just very sad because there's lots of stories that aren't being covered. There's no Hartford city reporter. And there are important stories in Hartford that aren't being written. So that's where the cost comes in. And that's heartbreaking. It, it, it is heartbreaking. It's, it's also in, in part an outgrowth of the fact that newspapers were once a money-making operation. They made money through all those ads and through all the classified ads. They were able to employ that number of people because it was a, it was a going concern. And now still as a for-profit organization. It is now dragged into the mud by hedge funds that just want to get every last little bit out of it. Then the, there's the other model, the model, Beth, that, that you and I work with with the Connecticut Mirror that I've worked with in public radio for such a long time. You know, that, that last photographer who left the Hartford Current a couple of weeks ago went to go work for Connecticut Public. Yep. My, old, my old station in, in the building that you're sitting in right now, Beth. Okay. Now, that model is a little different. And I guess I'm wondering about the future of news from a nonprofit side. I mean, we can talk a little bit about this. You and I know, Beth, that we've survived at the Connecticut Mirror through an awful lot of grants, uh, through an awful lot of major donors, through individual donors giving us dollars. And I can do a public radio fundraising pitch right now if you'd like me to. I can fall <laughs> out of bed and do one of those. And, you know, and people will give us $60 and get a tote bag. But is the future of news asking people directly to give what they can or asking some uh, wealthy donors or maybe some uh, some folks who can write big checks from grant making 
organizations, is that enough to support uh, an organization that's able to survive and thrive into the future, do you think? Well, I think that um, you need a lot of revenue from different places, right? So you can't just rely on grants from, you know, wherever, uh, foundations and, and whatever, or just rely on big donors, because what happens when those big donors go away? What happens when the foundation decides to, that it has a new cause that it wants to, uh, you know, fund and uh, support? So one of the things that we've been trying to do at the Mirror is really diversify our revenue generation. Um, and so that means you know we're we're reaching out to our readers and we're explaining that this is you know free to read but not free to to produce and we're actively um you know going for foundation grants and and things like that places that can support our journalism um without expecting anything in return but good journalism which is really the key here right because you don't want the influence on what you're doing every day because that's going to then erode the trust more even more in this profession and the product that we're that we're trying to convince people is factual so yeah it's it's complicated it hasn't gotten any easier um i'll say that but but i do believe that the nonprofit model is is the way to go. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about it when I applied for this job and started here. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've been fascinated to see the response from folks. And at different points in history, as we've gone through these tumultuous years recently, you know, people res readers responding, you know, people coming forward with money and donations because they see the the important vital role that journalism plays during a pandemic, during times of real unrest and upheaval, um, you know, but is it harder to do our jobs during those periods of time? You betcha, it is, you know, journalists are under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, we, we're getting a, a question here and I'd love to hear um, anybody on our panel uh, talk about it as, as my cat comes to visit me. This is the other part of the future of journalism as you do it at home, your cat's always in the shot. Um, or your kid. You, or your kid. That's right. Your kid or your grandkid. Somebody's always knocking at the door. Um, Jack asks, what hope is there to reach the majority of our society who will never pay to subscribe to journalism? And isn't this, Daniela, sort of the, the, the key to all of this, right? The other model that the Hartford Current had beyond the ads was, you know, people paid for the subscription and it came to their door. Online, it's a little bit different. There's been a million different models for how to do this. I don't know how many different newspapers I subscribe to, but the fact is, is that it adds up over time and you literally can't subscribe to all the newspapers you want to support or else you wouldn't have any money left yourself. And so Jack's asking, how do we reach the majority of the society who will never pay to subscribe to journalism? Even those of us who want to feel like it's overwhelming to have to subscribe to so many things in order to support journalism. A huge mistake was made if you could go back to, I don't know, 1995 or something, you know, newspapers decided they were going to put all their content out on websites for free. I mean, I'm not a business person, but even I know, like, that's just a boneheaded move. Who does that, right? You go into a store, <laughs> do you get things for free? I mean, that's just not the way it works, right? But that's that was a, a business decision, decision that was made. And then the industry actually had kind of a second bite at the apple because when everything moved from computers to mobile, right, you had your phone, you could have, you know, done it over then. And they also kind of missed the boat on that. Um, obviously, the times have caught up and, you know, probably, you know, six or seven years ago, I mean, the Times obviously hugely successful with their subscription um, program. Not every newspaper is the Times and you're absolutely right. You, you know, you want to read a story in, you know, your hometown paper, but you don't want to subscribe to it. You want to read, you know, a couple stories. You don't live there anymore or whatever. What's your option? I mean, it, there's got to be a better way. And there, I, I have to think there'd be smart people thinking about this, figuring it out. I, I think that uh, there's a, an awful lot of smart people trying to, to figure that out. I think a lot of those smart people are at subscription services like 
like Netflix and Hulu that somehow or other are able to get $9.95 out of me every month, yeah. whether or not I watch anything or not. And um, even Netflix, uh, they're having problems now. People are turning off to them. So, you know, we just saw that yesterday, right? So. It, well, it, it, exactly. I, you know, we had a, another question here about is the future journalism tilted um, toward audio versus text-based? Um, you know, I'm, I'm the person who's worked in audio for most of my career. Um, you folks have mostly worked in, in newspapers. I will say that the advent of podcasting is something that's sort of remarkable, but it does speak, I think, uh, Amanda, a little bit to the ways in which people get their information and how that has led to not just mistrust in the media, but more division within society. It is very easy to pick podcasts that directly talk into your earbuds and right into your skull and give you information that is just substantively not true. Or in the case of the most popular podcast in America right now, Joe Rogan's podcast, um, essentially giving out disinformation cloaked in trying to just, you know, make sure that people hear about all sorts of things. And, and I feel like that's a big piece of this future of journalism that we have to grapple with is that people are choosing to have sometimes folks who aren't doing very much journalism at all, just tell them stuff directly into their ears. And that's a very powerful way to get, to get a story told. Yeah, and sometimes those people speaking directly into the ears have done no original research, don't know what they're talking, and make wild claims that have that amount to nothing. Right? Um, you obviously are referencing Joe Rogan, who likes to say he's just asking questions, um, and I think that's where one of the um, misunderstandings about journalism is, and where one of the distrust, um, one of the, the areas of distrust, kind of comes from. Our jobs have never been to just ask questions. Journalists don't just ask questions because if we ask questions, we can get answers that are just full of BS. We can get just tons of misinformation. We can get uninformed opinions. We can just get trite coming out of their mouth, right? Like it's, it's nothing, um, that's not what our job was. And I think that you see that, you know, Rogan hiding behind that and a lot of, um, you know, the, these, you know, podcasts or, or blogs that's, that just kind of opened up to anyone's opinion is that the idea that that was always the job, but our job was always to help the public figure out what was truth, truth, and to be the guardians of that. And I've got to believe that people in the public will at some point, you know, feel like they want that, that they want people to be helping them figuring out what's true because, you know, it's, it's hard. And I think, you know, my students recognize that, that sometimes they just kind of wander into things and, and that they've gone down a path that's not, you know, the trustworthy facts that they should be looking for. And I think that eventually people will want that back. That's the, that's the going through to get past, you know? Well, but, yeah, I, I, and maybe they do, maybe they will. But at the moment, I mean, I think a lot of Americans would say, uh, Amanda, we, we do seek the truth. That's exactly why we listen to what Alex Jones has to say. Now, I can put my head in my hands and say, oh my God, I can't believe that that's what you see as a truth. But but he's a prime example. He's a Rogan connected, certainly. Yeah, sure. uh, it, but, but there's an example of someone who says things that aren't true, but passes them off as true and millions of people believe them they they too are looking for the truth and there's there's really there's no one getting in the way of them believing that that is something that's true like let's stop having them let them letting them say they're looking for the truth because they're not they're just not if you're what listening to alex jones you're listening to someone yelling things that contradicts himself he has come forward and said he doesn't believe that the things he's been saying for a decade about the sandy hook shooting were true he doesn't believe himself He's not looking for the truth. And the people listening to him are not looking for the truth either. They're looking for what they believe to be reinforced. It's motivated reasoning. It's um, you know just confirmation bias. He's saying things that make them feel better about themselves, whether that's because he's saying that it's not their fault, that someone else has done whatever it is to them as the white man or whatever aggrieved party they are. But yeah, we need to stop pretending like they're looking for the truth. They're not. And there are going to be people that we're not going to reach anytime soon. 
but hopefully we get to reach other people and we get to be better at what we were doing, telling the story of journalism, showing what we do, asking tough questions, showing that we are holding the powerful accountable and that we're not in the pockets of any major party or corporations, that we need to show that. And I think we demonstrate that, you know, and hope that that wins people who are not too far gone. Given the the problems with the economic model, though, um, Beth, I wonder about that that whole question of not being in the pockets of anyone. That's always a, a struggle. The more that that journalists struggle to find funding for their work, the more that we have to constantly grapple with the notion that someone is going to fund it, and we have to wonder whether or not, as as consumers whether or not there is any influence. I will tell you right now, working in public radio for a long time, if someone has something against one of the major funders of public radio, people will say, oh, there you go. You're in the pocket of X organization, and therefore you will only report in a certain way. And if the public believes that, it's really hard for us to turn that around. I think that that problem even gets worse as we have to go looking for more sources of income, more ways to fund the journalism that we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's up to each news organization to be very uh, you know, thoughtful and careful about where they seek funding and the, uh, the agreements that they make. I mean, to take that money. Like we are at the Mirror very, very careful about, you know, even if somebody gives us a grant, it's to do, it's to, you know, do stories on a topic. It's not to do specific stories that they sign off on, that they tell us what to write. They don't see the stories before they run. It's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to get some funding to do some environmental reporting on climate change. That's as, that's as specific as it gets. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, we want you to uh, write about a specific topic or present a specific point of view. So, um, you know, we're we try to be very conscientious about that. Um, and I think that we succeed. Um, and, but we're, you know, we're a small organization. Um, I, I would expect that this gets more complicated the larger you are. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think it also reinforces this need to have a diversified revenue stream where mm -hmm. you're getting, you're not just getting your money from one organization or type of organization, but rather a variety of sources, including the people who are consuming your news and need your news to make decisions. I think that that, that kind of gets at, I mean, it's not all that dissimilar from the old model in terms of the subscription base. You know, you had readers paying for subscriptions and you took advertising and it was very clear what the ads were. You know, they were not the news. <laughs> um, yeah, I, well, I think one thing that's interesting about the Connecticut Mirror model is in some ways it is a niche publication, right? It's about Connecticut policy and politics. It's broadened over the years to get outside of the Capitol. You've certainly grown in terms of adding more reporters, investigative reporters. So there's more to the Connecticut Mirror. But in a way, part of the, part of the model of the future, Beth, might be organizations like the Mirror that don't ever attempt to get as big as the old Hartford Current and serve everybody with everything, but right. serve people who really crave the information that the Mirror does in the way that it does it and stay of a certain size and stay focused so that you can really serve them. Yeah, I think that that's an, that's an ongoing conversation that we have in this organization that I have with the publisher, Bruce Putterman, um, and that we have as an organization with our board, which is, you know, our mission is, is clear. Um, and we wanna, we wanna kind of stay in that lane where we're attending to the mission of the organization. You know, we are very thoughtful about adding beats or coverage areas. Like we added economic development over the last year. Um, that was a very deliberate decision. Um, and we added investigative reporters. Um, and, and again, same kind of deliberate decision that, re, that, that backed up our mission. Um, and so we're never going to try to be the Hartford Current or a legacy newspaper. That's not in our future, I don't think. Unless, I mean, I can't predict the future 
you know, 50 years from now, but at least in the near future, that is, that is not on the table for us. We know our lane. Yeah. Well, so uh, Daniela, t- talk about the lane that you're in right now. I mean, you, you use that term niche publication when you talked about Route 50. Um, you're, you're doing work that's appealing to a smaller number of people. You're not trying to reach the broad audiences that the, that the Hartford Current reached. What else can you tell us about, about this work that you're doing right now and what that might point toward in, in terms of the future of journalism? Because doing really specific good journalism for smaller groups that crave that information is something I know that I've seen an explosion in over the course of the last several years. Yeah, and I'll definitely answer that question. I just want to say one quick thing about um, funding models because there's there's another sort of emerging um, uh, area of discussion in terms of funding, particularly local news, and that's looking to get government involved. And obviously, that brings a whole host of issues. But you know, I've been very active in the News Guild, and that's something that the News Guild leadership has um, has uh, supported very much is some type of a a federal support system um, for for local news, uh, you know, uh, local news organizations that are under siege. Um, as far as you know, things what I'm doing right now, there is an emphasis or a thinking on you know not just laying out the problems or following the money or doing all those kinds of stories, but also um, a little bit of what's known as solutions based journalism, which is really showing people. Um, what works and what good practices are and how they can you know, perhaps adapt them. And again, especially when you're dealing with a audience of folks who are sort of um, leaders in, in state and local government, they may be looking to, to say, hey, you know, Michigan did it this way, this may work in New Hampshire or wherever. Um, so there's you know, the whole solutions journalism thing, which you know, most people are, are familiar with at this point, I think um, provides another way of sort of framing what the news is and helping people make decisions, not just, you know, decision makers, not just state and local leaders, but really, you know, everybody, consumers, taxpayers, everybody to sort of look at how things can be done better because newspapers are obvious at newspapers and news organizations and TV and radio and, and all of them are very good at, you know, showing what's wrong, whether it's the official taking money or the person who wound up dead or, you know, whatever the, the coach who cheated or, you know, you can go down the list. But um, so those are important stories and those are those are a, an essential part of what we do. But now there's a sort of an ideology that's kind of springing up that like maybe instead of just pointing out the wrongdoing, let's show people how to do things correctly. So. Amanda, but I, I love your thoughts on this too, because as we talk about distrust of the news media, I mean, early on, you know, uh, Beth and Danielle were talking about, you know, you go and knock on people's doors late at night and you maybe tell them some bad news. There's a lot, even about local news that you trust, that people can have a negative connotation to. You're always looking for something that's wrong to point out to people. That's our job to a certain extent. But what Danielle is pointing to is, a type of journalism that really does seek solutions and hopefully leaves people with, I don't know, something that comes out of the journalism that they can take and move forward with and say, oh yeah, maybe there, maybe there is a solution here. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it helps to highlight the good work being done in our community too, um, with a, you know, more um, practical lens than perhaps the fluffy features we might have done, you know, back in the day. I think solutions journalism is a great way, one one of the many tools that we should be using going forward. Um, You know, I think that we should also just be reevaluating a lot of those practices. I mean, you know, we've all probably cringed at some point watching TV news where something horrible has happened and a reporter leans and goes, how does that make you feel to someone who's in the worst point of their time, of their life? Everybody knows that anecdote. And we see journalists doing it still. Um, There are lots of ways that we have not always been, showed our humanity and our empathy in our reporting. Um, I mean, I think most of us have, and you know that 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 stereotype's not fair to most of us, but I mean, there certainly are a lot of things that we've not done well when it comes to covering our local communities. It's always it's it's often just been a part of the community anyway. So I think we're in that part where we're reassessing not only you know are we covering just negative things and how can we show the solutions, but how can we show a more broad picture of our communities, you know, and other people in them? And it does need to be more than you know horse race politics. Gosh. 
election ends and I read the polls for the next election already, that we've done that. That's what the national news media did. We turned our politics into a game that polling was the only thing that matters. And even the national news organizations doing really good work when it comes to politics, still write those same kind of stories. Instead of looking at how a bill will actually affect people, which you know is is a somewhat in that solutions journalism frame, frame. You know how will this work? How could it fix something? We talk about who's going to win and lose if this bill fails, and how, what does it mean for Democrats' congressional prospects if this bill fails now in you know March or April? You know, it's that that framing is we've caused that problem, um, and I know that takes us in a different area. No, but no, no, but it, but it's it's, it's a good with everything. It's a really good area to get to. I think one of the one of the problems is, and you see this, it's the reason why it's on cable news every night, and the reason newspapers write about it, and websites have cropped up just to cover the horses is because people love it. But like, yeah. I mean, that's one of the problems is, is it's entertainment for people. We have we've pushed people to tribalism, and that's where we are. We are in a tribalized society, a polarized society where people are rooting for their tribes, and we're reinforcing that bad behavior and the way we cover things. I'm not saying you don't write about polls, and I'm certainly saying you, that you're not, I'm not saying you don't cover elections. But I, I have been saying for you know 30 years, <laughs> you know, that we've got to stop covering politics and we have to start covering governance. What works, what doesn't. You know, it's it should be less about who's winning and losing and more about policy for people and change. You know, and um, I, that's that's to your point, not always the stories that everyone's going to read. We've got to be more creative about that and figure out how we reach people with the stories that matter and stop just feeding them chum, you know? Mm. Yeah. How do you think about that, Beth? Well, I, you know, I, I think that that's basically the, the mission of the mirror is we cover only public policy and politics. Um, and it has been, um, you know, my, pride really uh, and joy to lead a team that has been able to write policy stories that actually tell tell human stories what does this policy mean for actual human beings you know do we get do we get to that place in every single story no um, but the pandemic um, as awful as it was for us as, human beings and, and journalists um, did force us kind of out of, um, at least in my organization, out of our routines. We had been very kind of firmly rooted in the state capitol. And, you know, th there was no legislative session to cover. There was no legislative office building to go to and schmooze with um, politicians and staffers. Uh, we, my reporters had to go find different ways of telling stories about what this pandemic and what was happening to this state. And they did. Um, and, you know, even under the most difficult circumstances in the beginning of the pandemic, when people were afraid to leave their houses, some of them. Um, and I have, you know, nothing but admiration for them for being able to do that. And journalists all over this country did that as well, I should say, not just my organization, Daniela did it, other people did. I mean, amazing work that reflected our humanity back at, uh, at us. Um, and I couldn't be more proud to be a journalist than I have been in the last few years. We're getting a, a few questions in our Q&A feature, and I know that some folks joined our conversation a little bit late. I will say that we are recording this, and we hope to make it available uh, in the future as well, in case you missed some of the, the front, in case you missed my little spiel, as they say, about how to ask your questions. There is a Q&A function at the bottom, and you can just type your question in there, and we will try to get to as many of them in the last couple of minutes of this program as we can. Mary asks us a a question. It's actually a comment here. Journalism isn't dead. It just moved online. Veteran journalists who lament the loss of printed newspapers are harming the public's view of the new digital journalism. That's it. I, I think it's a very interesting point, Mary. I, I'm wondering, Daniela, how, how you, you think about that and how we could think about that as we as we move into the future. Look, the fact is, is that the old fashioned newspaper that is is thick and is full of ads and has a lot of great stories and columns by people who are gainfully employed at big city newspapers, that's just not going to happen anymore. But we are getting our news in a different way. It has moved online in, in some way. 
What, what do you say to the to the Mary McGee's of the world who say, look, we, we can't be complaining about, you know, the old newspapers being dead. There's a there's a new thing now. I, I, I you know, you laugh when people say, oh, I get all my news from Facebook. Well, if you're not getting it from like your neighbor's rants or whatever, you're getting it from legitimate news organizations. People are posting stories from the Times or the Current or the Mirror or any, you know, any any news, you know, publication or, or TV station or whatever. And, and so you're just getting it through Facebook, but it's the same thing, whether you buy it, you know, whether, whether you see it in, in a legacy newspaper, whether you see it on the, on a website, whether you're looking at headlines on your phone, it, it all comes from the same place. It comes from journalists. So it's really no different, but obviously the way the tools that you have are different. You can tell a story differently on TikTok or on Instagram than you can, you know, in, in a print in a print newspaper, but, you know, ultimately it's journalists who are providing the content, you know, unless again, it's your crazy uncle posting a rant and then, you know, that's a good <laughs> well, story. Well, now, and we're not necessarily, I mean, we're not talking just about your crazy uncle, right? Though, I mean, you know, there's a lot of different ways in which people are getting their news. As we've said before, there's an awful lot of people who write blogs or do yeah. podcasts who are not legitimate journalists. I mean, who's the number one Substack person, right? Is it still Heather Cox Richardson? I mean, she's not a journalist and she has a massive following and people pay money for that newsletter and it's really good. And, you know, so, I mean, yeah, you're right. It's, it's simplistic what I said before to say it's just posted stories, but a lot of it is still posted stories, but it's lots of different formats. You're correct. But I, I'm wondering, Amanda, do we do we point to to some sort of a future in which it's even more diffuse? We have more people who are doing some of the things that journalists do, maybe on their own, maybe on Substack or Patreon or just through their own TikTok feed, and we're able to cobble together some sort of a truth through all of that by having a whole lot of people do an awful lot of what traditional journalists have done in the past. Um, I, I agree with somewhat of that in that I think the journalists of the future are not traditional journalists and they're telling stories in different ways. But I think this idea that citizen journalists were going to actually provide truth and provide journalism was the notion of the 90s that kind of got us to where we are. Um, they're not going to. Well, we've seen great um, contributions to information and news from people with cell phone videos and that kind of thing. But we've also seen just rapid spread of misinformation and lunacy. Um, so we can't expect that non-journalists are picking up the slack. But I, I do think that something Mary said, and I, and I don't want to misunderstand where, where she was coming from, but I certainly see this often when we talk about the future of news, where people think that we're lamenting the loss of the print paper. None of us up here are in, under any delusions that the print paper is coming back. That's not what we're lamenting the loss of. It's what I think people don't understand about what happened, is that when that print product went away, advertising suddenly went to Craigslist and he made all the money or to Facebook, they suddenly get the money. And you used to pay for the news to arrive at your door and now you pay to log into the internet. That's what you pay for, that's where the money goes. And you get no information from that, no reporters are paid from those dollars anymore. And I think that we, we think that the public has a more sophisticated understanding than they do about what our complaints are. It's not that we lament the loss of a print product, that, that we're worried it's gonna to go towards audio or that we think we might have to do TikTok stories. It's that we, li we live in a society where it takes money to do reporting. It takes money to do, to do, to have a website, to do anything, to have a blog, any of those things cost money. And so we need to find a way to fund people who care about the truth and step in there to do the kind of journalism that matters. Um, maybe they're going to be independent and they'll be funded through grants and they'll tell all these great alternative stories. But I don't think that we should, I think we've had enough of a history of the internet to know that non-journalists aren't stepping up for that either. So we have a question here from from John, and th this I'm sure will will 
rub some younger people who are in our audience the wrong way. He says, millennials and younger people seem incurious, unaware, and ignorant of what is going on, local, state, national, et cetera. Why is that? Does that indicate what our press could or should be doing? Hmm. I, I mean, I, I could come back to you, Amanda, because you're dealing with young people, college students all the time. Do you sense that younger people are are incurious in this way that they don't care what's happening in local, state, national politics? It, it is a way for us older folks to lampoon them sometimes. <laughs> sure, I, I, yes and no. I mean, man, local and state, yeah. I mean, I think that's a recognition of this globalized society, right? Um, mm. My students are often more aware of something happening on the global scene, and they're definitely more aware of something happening in national politics or on the national scene or in celebrity news um, than they are about things that are happening locally or their state. And I think that speaks a little bit to the to, to the loss of our community functions. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking on a global scale, buying on a global scale, um, you know, and debating national politics. And I don't know that people feel that connection to their local town and state as maybe they once did in a way that we're all connected. And I know these are things that Daniela and Beth are thinking about a lot more than me. But I, for my younger students, man, trying to get them to like focus on state news or local news, that's really tough. Okay, but so, so Beth here, you lead an organization that is committed to local and state news for it to have a future, right? people younger than my age have to be interested in local and state news in the future, right? So what yeah. do we do about that? Well, I think that the answer, well, I would, I, I would let me backtrack. I don't, I don't agree that that generation is not curious. Um, I think they're very curious about a lot of different things. I don't think though that they have gotten in the habit as older generations did of consuming news in the way that we all did and even people older than us did. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I too taught college, I taught at Southern and um, I taught English composition. And one of the ways that I got my students to engage in writing and, and reading, to be honest, was by making them read the op-ed op -ed page of the New York Times every Sunday and write a pray say on it. And you wouldn't even believe I created like groupies for some of these op-ed writers. They followed them on Twitter. They like, they, they, they just needed an opportunity to, to engage. And in that case, it was mostly on national and international topics, but you know, hey, it was legitimate journalism and it was you know very high level writing and I was thrilled I mean did I reach every single student no but I reached a lot of them um, and I think that we have to as journalists in now you know as a, as a newsroom leader you know we have to think about how we how, how we can engage these younger people of, with the stories that we're writing are we writing stories that they're interested in reading um, and I'm not saying that we should switch to covering celebrity news as a policy news organization, no, but are we covering policies that they care about? Are we covering them in a way that they can relate to? Because they consume media in ways that we don't necessarily consume media. So that is an ongoing conversation. That's why you see news organizations hiring audience specialists and, and, and young people who are, you know, um, really good with video and all different kinds of um, media, you know, and not just stuck in the written word or a photograph. Um, so I think there's a future there. We just have to figure out where the interest is and how to reach them. And, and, and a lot of news organizations are, are, are doing that and are, are continuing to do that. I, before, I we were, before we were, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, it's, I'm glad that there's some hope there. Um, before we run out of time, we got a question here from, from Chip, and this is a sort of a, a foundational journalism question. Let me read it. While I understand the desire to tell the story of how policy affects individual people, every policy has lots of winners and losers and, it's the balance of winners and losers that matters. How do you decide which individual story to tell? How do you communicate how you choose which side of the policy to emphasize with the in individual anecdote? Wow, Daniela, this is a this is a tough question. It gets right to the heart of like how and why we do what we do. We 
we have a story and we want to exemplify it in some way. We want to tell it with, with real people's voices, but you got to choose some people. And Chip's asking, how do you do that? Well, I, I think you don't have to, you know, not every story is just one story and that's it. And you're only bite at the apple. So some stories might be told from one person's perspective. And, you know, sometimes you might tell the story to the person who wants the change. Other times you might look at who's being hurt by this policy and let's talk to them. Other times you might look at why does this person want this? I mean, there's so many different lenses that you can look at through it. And I think as a way to tie back to the earlier question about how do you engage younger readers? And I strongly disagree with the person who said they're not engaged, but I think they are and their lives depend on it because they're the ones that are gonna be inheriting all the problems that we're leaving them. And I personally think they're very clued in because state issues and uh, you know, state and local issues are national issues. Climate change is, is something that's discussed a lot at the state capitol. It's an international issue, but you know, it's abortion. We saw that yesterday. So I think, you know, when you're telling those stories, you tell them through the eyes of the people who are being affected, but you know, maybe you, you tell multiple stories through multiple different lenses. Yeah. I think that that's always, always something. Another thing that people who aren't part of the business don't necessarily understand is they, they take a look at one story and they say, well, in this one story, you did this, but meanwhile, there've been you know, a dozen stories written about it over the course of, of several weeks. And that's also part of the way that, that we tell the story. We, we have to think of things a little bit differently. Uh, having everything digital and online forever changes things an awful lot. Stories that you wrote, Daniela, back in the 1990s, some facts may have changed, but those 1990s stories are still sitting out there for everyone to read, just like you wrote them the very first time. And that's another uh, thing that we have to grapple with in the current way that we that we tell stories and present them. Um, before we run out of time, one last question that, that Joelle puts uh, to us that I think is, is really what this is all about, just simply asks, what will the new models look like? We've, we've talked about some of them. I, I'd love to just get some thoughts for, from each of you in as much as you, you've thought about this, because all of you are doing the work that you're doing right now, trying to create this new future of news. Do you have any sense of, of what the new model uh, looks like, Amanda, in the future, something that, you, that you're hopeful about in terms of the future of news? Um, well, I think one thing is that we are all uh, reconsidering the um, what objectivity means and how we approach that. Um, you know, I use this phrase faux objectivity, which I think is what journalists wrap themselves in for a really long time, where we really didn't explain what we were doing or why or why we were saying something. We were just quoting two sides of an issue. And I think that, you know, I'm hopeful that the model on the other side looks like, um, you know, aggressive truth telling. Um, you know, that, that is, um, you know, that is its strongest loyalty. And I think it'll be more storytelling. We'll see, you know, you already brought up podcasting, but there's lots of ways we can tell stories that are filled with facts and, you know, finding those alternative story forms can be exciting. Daniela, how about you? I just hope it's uh, more equitable and uh, not just, you know, from the perspective of uh, the people who have been telling the stories for centuries in this country and maybe broadening you know, as we were talking about in the earlier question, broadening that lens, telling things differently uh, through different perspectives and giving giving different voices a platform. Absolutely. Beth, how about you? I mean, I, I guess that was kind of what I was going to say, which is that, you know, we we make decisions about who we call for to talk to for every single story, right? And we strive to be fair. Uh, and when we tell those stories, but Daniela raises a really good point. You know, we are making a decision um, about who we are calling and who we are seeking comment from and who we, whose side of the story we are telling. And I think that there has been a groundswell of change in this business over the last few years where we've started to examine those decisions and why we're making them and be more transparent about how we're making them. Um, I know that work is going on here. I know it's going on at other organizations. I think there's nothing but good that can come from that. And maybe that is the answer to one of the main answers to rebuilding trust. I, I wanna thank all of the people who asked such great questions and people who took part in this conversation. I wanna thank our guests, Beth Hamilton, uh, Daniela Altamari and Amanda Crawford. 
Uh, thanks to Michelle Troy and all the folks at the University of Hartford for making this possible, and to Bruce Putterman and Kyle Constable and everyone at the Connecticut Mirror for making this and other events like it possible. Thanks to all of you so much for being part of this tonight. Thank you. And, and I just want to say something quickly. As, as I do these events for the Connecticut Mirror, I'm going to just make a, a, a quick pitch. I know that I said that you can't support all of the journalism that's out there. You, yes. you, you can't give money to all the public radio stations. You can't support all the podcasts you like. You can't subscribe to all the newspapers. But when you find information that you do trust and that you do like, you do need to support it in some way. I think about it in terms of that Hulu bill that I get every month that's $9.95, whether or not I watch anything or not. So as you think about the way to spend your scarce uh, disposable income, think about the journalists who are doing this work at these organizations, uh, the journalists that are being trained by Amanda and by others at the University of Hartford right now to try to make a future for journalism and give a little something, try to support it when you can and support the Connecticut Mirror. There's a, there's a little donate button right at the top right corner. Thanks so much for taking part in this. I'm John Dankosky. Please have a good evening.